Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hive's protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thank you, Sherry, and thanks to Bee Culture for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. And a quick thanks to all of our sponsors whose support enables us to bring you this podcast each week without resorting to a fee-based subscription. We don't want that, and we know you don't either. Make sure to check out all of our other content on our website. There you can read up on all of our guests, read our blog on various aspects and observations about beekeeping, search for, download, and listen to over 200 past episodes, read episode transcripts, (laughs) leave comments and feedback on each show, and check on podcast specials from our sponsors. You can find it all at www.beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. Hey, everybody. Thanks again for joining the show. Kim will be along in just a few minutes. How would you like to give us a hand? We're looking to start the show in a different way in the coming weeks, and we would like to include you and your fellow listeners. Okay, this is how you can help us out. Record yourself opening the show using your cell phone or whatever you can use. Say, hey, everybody, this is Jeff from Olympia, Washington, and I want to welcome you to Beekeeping Today podcast. Well, you wouldn't say my name, of course. You'd say your name and where you're in your town and your state. Here's another great idea. At your next beekeeper meeting, get together with everybody and open the show as one group. Something like, welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast from the Olympia Beekeepers Association. Just make sure your recording is clear and understandable and something you'd be proud for thousands of beekeepers around the world to hear. Simply email your opening to questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com and listen for your opening and a future episode. We have a great show lined up for you today, including Ed Colby, who's stuck in Steamboat Springs. It's a great tale, and I'm sure you will enjoy it. And for our main talk today, we are talking with Jennifer Berry and Scott Griffith of the University of Georgia. They're here to talk about their golf and bees project. Golf and bees, that doesn't seem to go well together, does it? It's kind of like oil and vinegar, but you'd be surprised. It's a great subject. And at the end, you'll have another great idea for a bee yard. As promised, up first is Ed Colby with a story from his book, A Beekeeper's Life, Tales from the Bottom Board. Ed's book is an attractive paperback collection of over 60 of Ed's best bee culture columns, along with photos. He has signed copies available. Check the show notes for details. I go up to Steamboat Springs, Colorado to chase bees. It takes me about three days to make my rounds. I sleep in the bee yards. Then I head back to the honey house in Meeker, and back home to the farm in Newcastle, a total of about three and a half hours from Steamboat, the way I go. I love my 1983 Ford one-ton honeybee truck, even if it's ugly, and even if that 460 engine does like to drink gas. Let's not talk about gas mileage. But heading up the hill out of Steamboat toward Clark the other day, the beast up and died. It did this without warning or provocation. I coasted to a ranch driveway and pulled off. Now any combustion engine needs two things, fuel and spark. I disconnected the gas line at the carburetor and turned the key. Then I peered under the hood. Gasoline was boiling on top of the engine. This didn't strike me as a good time to check for spark. Everything in my ignition system was brand new except for the coil. 
that being the electromagnet that intensifies the spark that burns the gas, and the control module, the mini computer that regulates ignition. I didn't think about the control module right then. I haven't owned this truck very long, and I'm not much of a mechanic. To be perfectly honest, I didn't know I had a control module. It was 4.45 in the afternoon on Saturday, and I decided to call an auto parts store pronto and buy a coil. I had to do something, even if it was wrong. When I walked up to the ranch barn to use the phone, the Texan ranch owner said, it's probably your timing chain. They'll have to tear your engine apart. He seemed to take pleasure in telling me this. Over the phone, the lady at the auto parts store said she'd leave the coil in a plastic bag hanging on the bumper of the trailer outside because they were closing. Afterward, the ranch owner said, it's not your coil. It might be your control module, but it's probably your timing chain. Well, can you recommend a good mechanic in Steamboat, I asked. I can't, he said, because there aren't any. You'd have to go to Craig. You can't get anything done in this town. At this point, I called Esther and threw myself at her mercy. Esther, rescue me, I said. I'll be there in 10 minutes, she said. Esther and I go way back, although I never really knew her that well. She's the daughter of my very old and very dear friend, Granny, who in my youth taught me to smoke and cuss. Granny kept telling me I ought to look up Esther in Steamboat this summer, and I'd meant to, but you know how it is. Now I felt a little awkward calling her simply because I needed help. I wished I'd made a social call first, taking her to lunch, whatever. Esther put me in her grandkids' bedroom downstairs. I slept in one of those narrow little kids' beds. The room was full of toys. You can sleep with a teddy if you want, Esther said. The next morning over coffee and eggs, I got her laughing, which is something I can sometimes make people do. She loaned me her car. I installed the new coil, but the truck still wouldn't start. I managed to shock myself twice, testing for spark, so I knew I had it. Now the only thing between the repair shop and me was a control module. After I bolted on a new one, I was almost afraid to turn the key because this was my last glimmer of hope and I had a sinking feeling. Occasionally things do go my way, however. The engine started right up. Earlier, when I didn't really think I'd get on the road that day, I made plans to lunch with my old ski patrol buddy Wilbur. Now, with the truck fixed, and after nearly a week on the road, I was itching to finish up with my bees and head for home. I can be self-centered, and in fact, that is my nature. But this one time, I put a friend first. You're probably wondering if I had honey supers on the truck, and the answer is yes. Fortunately, there was a honey flow, so robbing bees didn't plague the supers while I was parked in a stranger's driveway. This could have complicated things immensely especially if I'd needed to get towed to a garage. So my tail has a silver lining. No robbers, and the whole adventure only cost me a hundred bucks. Well, maybe a couple hundred. And I got to renew two old friendships. How big a disaster is that? Plus, now I've replaced everything in my truck's ignition system. If it quits on me again, I'll know it has to be the timing chain. A week to the day later, on a Saturday evening, I lost a dually wheel hauling three tons of honey through Craig. This time another friend bailed me out, and the weekend cost me a lot more than $200, but that's another story. Spring brings wild and unpredictable weather. To limit the chance of colony starvation before your first honey flow, it is vital to add Hive Alive fondant now. In a cold snap, bees can starve because they cannot access their stores. When you place fondant right over the cluster, food is accessible for your bees when they need it. Now is the perfect time to stock up from a wide selection of high-quality honeybee feed supplements. You can choose from Hive Alive's liquid blend to our 
our Hive Alive 15% Real Pollen Fondant Patties. Our unique liquid blend has seaweed extracts, thyme, and lemongrass, and is scientifically proven to maintain low disease levels. You'll have more bees with improved bee gut health and more honey this season. To learn more about each of our quality products, visit the website www.usa.hivealivebees.com. Be sure to use the code BTP at the checkout to receive your special discount. Hey, beekeepers! Many times during the year, honeybees encounter scarcity of floral sources. As good beekeepers, we feed our bees artificial diets of protein and carbohydrates to keep them going during those stressful times. What is missing, though, are key components. The good microbes necessary for a bee to digest the food and convert it into metabolic energy. Only Super DFM Honeybee by strong microbials can provide the necessary microbes to optimally convert the artificial diet into energy necessary for improving longevity, reproduction, immunity, and much more. Super DFM Honeybee is an all-natural probiotic supplement for your honeybees. Find it at strongmicrobials.com or at fine bee supply stores everywhere. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, their regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Sitting across the virtual Zoom table are Jennifer Berry and Scott Griffith, both from the University of Georgia, here to talk about bees and golf, or golf and bees, whatever your priority is. Welcome, Jennifer and Scott, to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer and Scott, it's good to meet you. I'm going to get to what your relationship is with your golf course, but I got to tell you, golf and bees just don't seem to go together to me. (laughs) How does that work? You know, I get that all the time. That's actually the first question I usually receive when people ask me about the beehives. It's like, why? And and I've gotten to the point where I'm just saying, why not? Jennifer, can you introduce Scott to the people listening today so we know what he's up to at that golf course? Scott is the Director of Agronomy for the University of Georgia Golf Course. I'll let him explain a little bit more about his background. So I've been in the golf business for 25 years, the last 16 years at the University of Georgia. My position title just recently changed from Golf Course Superintendent to Director of Agronomy. And that just means that I now have a Golf Course Superintendent who works underneath me. But I'm also past president of the Georgia Golf Course Superintendents Association past winner of their Superintendent of the Year Award, the Environmental Leaders in Golf Award, the President's Award, and also serve just recently elected Board of Director for the Golf Course Superintendents Association of America, which has 19,000 members worldwide. Wow. You know, when you think about all the golf courses, it seems like it'd be a wonderful mix to put beehives along the golf courses. I'm not a golfer, so I don't know the right terminology. So feel free to correct me. I could see that happening. It's a great place for for bees, not only bees, for pollinator plots. And most golf courses have out-of-the-way areas, places that are not in play. So there's a lot of opportunities to do those things. You just need champions Golf course superintendents are used to those people that get behind these projects and like to see them come to fruition. Let's let's be honest here. Golf has had a perception issue for a long time, and it's one of the things we focus on on a national level is getting the, the word out and the truth about what we do and trying to dispel the, the misconceptions that we have about golf in general. And so the bees have allowed us to do that. It's, it's been such a great conversation <laughs> starter for me with individuals, especially those those that are looking at me from the putting green when I'm near the hive, and they're like, that dude's going to get stung. You know? <laughs> so it gives me a chance to kind of communicate, and it, and it puts us out there where we can tell people about the great things that we do. If I may, I would interject on what he was saying about the mis- misconception of golf and golf courses. When Scott reached out to me and said, hey, I'm Scott, I'm at the golf course here at UGA, and I want to put beehives on the golf course. I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> Are you crazy? Because, again, what did I think? Pesticides, all the all the things they're using will kill the bees. And he immediately, you know, switched my focus and was like, Jennifer, this is not the case at all. So anyway, like you were saying, it, it and, and, I'm, and I'm really happy 
that Scott reached out to us and he's doing this because we need to get this information out and educate. And not only are we educating people about golf courses, but we're educating the golfers about bees, Mm -hmm. which to me is our whole mission at the UGA or the University of Georgia Bee Lab. I'm glad you brought this up because I know of our beekeeping listeners, 90% of them probably even before they listen to this episode, were thinking, oh my God, why are they putting bees on a golf course? Everybody knows how much pesticides and fertilizers are on that golf course. It's going to kill the bees. And I'm glad we're talking about it now. Let's get this out of the way. So why is that not an issue? You mentioned pesticides and fertilizers. There's a large misconception about how much we use and what we use and how we use it. I mean, First of all, let me say this. We're some of the most highly trained applicators in the world. We have state-of-the-art of equipment. I mean, I have a GPS sprayer that I use that can put it within six inches of where it needs to be. Most of the products that are used are only on a limited basis. They're usually only used on greens. So you're only treating a very small percentage of the golf course, only about five or less than 10% of the golf course is getting treated a lot of times. The amount of fertilizer, listen, we have budgets. We want to make money. And we don't want to be using fertilizer. Just you know, not not many of us have that kind of money to be doing those kind of things. So, you know, we use polymer coated fertilizer, slow release fertilizers. We fund research on the backside of things to, to show that we're good stewards of the land. So there's a lot of misconceptions out there. And that's why I'm excited to talk to you guys, because it gives us an opportunity to tell that story, which is that's the hardest part sometimes is being able to have an opportunity to tell the story. Well, Scott, you mentioned that you had worked out, you were using it for education. Who are you teaching and what are you teaching these people about bees? And is that where Jennifer gets a part of this? Well, that's where Jennifer came in, you know, for that education event that we had. We had an indoor education and an outdoor, a hands-on educational component of that. And I basically turned it over to Jennifer and and allowed her to let her, I, I let her choose what she felt like we needed to know as golf course superintendents. So I really left that up to her. She's the professional on that side of things. But our participation for that event was, we sell out that event every year, but I mean, I was amazed at how many golf course superintendents that we had that were interested. Also, it kind of made me laugh a little bit when all of them were kind of twinkle toeing up there because they were all <laughs> scared of getting stung. So by the end of it, it was really neat to see them kind of, you know, relax a little bit and, and taking in the information that Jennifer was providing them. It sounds like underneath, you're trying to get these guys to do the same thing. You're trying to get more bees and more golf courses. Am I right? You are correct. We want our members and our super, fellow superintendents to use it as a, a moment to kind of get the word out, not only about how golf courses are safe environments for wildlife and pollinators and honeybees, but it's also to get a chance to talk about honeybees and the problems that they have and bring awareness to honeybees in general. So I worked with Jennifer and we created a sign that we put out near our hive that has about six or seven quick facts on it about honeybees. We also put a QR code on there too, which links to to the UGA Bee Lab as well too, in case anybody needed any more information about it. So it's just bringing awareness to honeybees into golf courses and how they relate. Scott, I got two questions, but first I want to go over to Jennifer and let her give the people listening a little bit of background. You're with the University of Georgia Bee Lab, right, Jennifer? What are you up to there right now? A multitude of projects. We have been working with Dalen. I'm sure some of your listeners or you have heard about the honeybee vaccine. Maybe a few. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We're very excited to be working with them and Last year, we did procedural work for them to get the USDA approval for the vaccine. And this year, we're doing more efficacy work with them. So that's a project. We've got a grad student that's working on small hive beetles. We're continuing with our oxalic acid application, trying to hone in on what's the best way to use oxalic acid in controlling Varroa. We'll be publishing a paper this, hopefully, (laughs) when I can get it written. We're hopefully going to publish that in the next couple of months. But basically, we found that when we applied a brood break to during a summer month, during our summer months, that we were actually able to reduce varroa mite populations. And we are very excited about getting that information out. And 
back in school. We're teaching a course now, a Bees, Beekeeping, and Pollinator Conservation course. It's a 3,000 level course. It was geared towards non majors, but science majors have really taken hold on it. It's become one of the most popular courses in the College of Ag right now. We're going from 72 students this past semester to 300 students in the fall. You're going to need an auditorium for that. Yeah, they're putting us in an auditorium, which is a little intimidating, but I'm, I'm very excited. Bees are, bees are such a hot topic right now, and this is the time for us to really strike educationally and through science to get people aware of, of the importance but yeah, the, the class is great. That's why I'm back in school getting the PhD because I want to be able to teach it. I mean, I'm teaching it now, but I'm not really the professor on record. You got to have that PhD in order to to get any kind of acknowledgement. But yeah, yeah, we're still I'm doing a lot of extension and just trying to keep the the lab afloat, basically. So for the listeners who aren't familiar with you and haven't read your articles, you are well versed in, in a long history and and beekeeping and bees. <laughs> I've been a beekeeper since 1997, and I've been running the bee lab since 2000. So, what, 23 years now? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, what? So, yeah, I, and I, I can't imagine doing anything else. When I took the first course in, in bees and beekeeping, I'm like, I want to do this for the rest of my life. And I have been given the great opportunity to do it. And so, I don't go to work. <laughs> there you go. That's a great way to look at it. Hey, this is a great place for a quick break to hear from our sponsors. We're thinking spring here at Better Bee. Do you have all the hive bodies and frames you need to super up your hives or expand your apiary? If not, we have you covered with high quality woodenware made by our sister company, Humble Abodes. Humble uses eastern white pine from the backwoods of Maine to manufacture box joints that are guaranteed to fit together tightly and frame parts that are easily assembled. Give us a call to learn more about any of our products or to ask a beekeeping question. We've got you covered. Shop for wooden boxes and frames at betterbee.com wood. Well, Jennifer, you mentioned that vaccine that you guys are working with. And for the people listening, if you didn't catch it, we had Keith Delaplane on, who works in your lab also. You work with him. And he was on, and he's been involved with this company and the vaccine. And it sounds like it's pretty good. You got an opinion on it so far, since you're closer than probably almost anybody. Well, unfortunately, I can't say much at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I will say I'm very excited that they got the USDA approval. They are working on distribution possibly this year, you know, because it's a, it's a, it's a cooperation and it's an agreement between business and our lab. We're, you know, we're not really allowed to say so too much at this point. Let me just say this. (laughs) I'm very excited. I'm very excited by the process and what this could lead to. Well, that's good. Anything that non chemical. We're putting in a beehive has got to be better than another chemical. So this is good. It was interesting talking to Keith about some of the things that were involved getting to the point where you're at now. So I imagine, Scott, you're going to be one of the first ones to use it once <laughs> once it's okay. You're right next door there, right? Absolutely. You mentioned bringing in superintendents to classes that you're teaching, and Jennifer's part of that. What are you teaching and what other techniques you got going there? Most of this education is outdoor education. It's the one event of the year that we try to choose things that are that can be done outdoors. So one year we did tree cutting, tree safety, pruning, those kind of things. Another year we did landscape construction, rock walls, thing, walkways and things like that. We just try to choose things that can be done outdoors that we think our superintendents will benefit from. Bees are going to have to be one of the things they'll benefit from, I hope. It sounds like it's going in the right direction, definitely. Jennifer, are you part of this education thing? Yeah, so it's a one-day or the one-day event that I was invited to. And so I taught in the morning, basically, you know, kind of the importance of honeybees, how to protect them, what's going on, why they're dying. And then in the afternoon, we moved out into the beehive. And like you said, you know, at first people were a little little nervous, kind of standing back. By the end, they were right on top of it. And that I always, I kind of find whenever we bring people who are non-beekeepers out to the bee yard, they're very apprehensive in the beginning. 
But once they see that we're not going to be attacked and thrown to the ground by bees and drug off and stung to death, they come very close to the hive. And usually you're having to knock them back like, you know, stand back. I can't breathe. So it was it was a good day. And a lot of the the superintendents came up to me afterwards telling me that they are very excited about getting beehives or some of them already had. They were getting in touch with local beekeepers in their area because this was a national or a statewide state association. So they were excited about moving forward. And like I said, anytime I hear that anyone, whether it be just a private person or a business, is wanting to put beehives out and start protecting our pollinators, I just am 100 percent behind it. Because as you know, we are in desperate need, especially of land and land that's going to provide nectar and pollen and safe space and, and areas, you know, for shelter and nesting, et cetera. So I think the golf course program, the golf course B program, I guess mm-hmm. we can, we have now sure. is just absolutely wonderful. I honestly had an individual, a colleague of mine that just came up to me just last week. He did not start a hive himself, but he said he was talking to his dad about it and was you know, explaining the education that he went through and his dad got excited about it, started looking into it and has now started a house. So, you know, it's not may not always reach the golf course superintendent, but it, the word gets out and kind of spreads a little bit. And and that's how you just spread the good word and try to reach as many people as you can. Is listening to the show and I'm a beekeeper and I'm thinking, well, gosh, this opens up a whole new area where I can place beehives. So as a beekeeper, I know where I want to put bees. Where is you as a golf course superintendent, where should a beekeeper keep their bees? I mean, it's definitely not there by the tee off pins, right? It is. Oh, is it? Yeah. It probably is. <laughs> as a beekeeper, how can I best work with my local golf course to find the most appropriate place for my beehives? Let me say this before I answer your question. If you like golf or you play golf or you know somebody that plays golf, I would recommend any beekeepers listening to contact your local golf course superintendent, ask them if they're interested, and see if you can trade out some free golf. Because <laughs> which, that's Jennifer and I have done that. I've, <laughs> I've tried to reach out to her and say, hey, I'd like to say thanks. Here's some passes to play golf. Maybe you don't play golf, but maybe you know somebody that does. So it's kind of a two-way street. As far as the, the location is concerned of hives on the golf course, Jennifer and I looked at that together. I actually got her to come out, look at our site, and we kind of picked a, you know, a balance together, but we wanted it to be highly visible. So we did it near our putting green and near where most of our traffic goes by. We put a little bit off of the path and our carts have GPS on them. So we can restrict areas to our golf carts. So <laughs> we can kind of quarantine that area where golf carts can't drive near it. We put rope and stake just to kind of as a deterrent to say, hey, we're trying to get your attention. We want you to let you know that there's something here. If you don't feel comfortable coming, then you probably don't need to cross these ropes here. So there's a lot of locations for for, for golf course superintendents to place them. Mm-hmm. And we'd always recommend, you know, maybe not put it right outside the pro shop where everybody's walking right out the door, but put it somewhere where it's highly visible, where you can people get see it and they start asking questions. Yeah, that when he first called me and said, can you come out and let's look for a spot? I assume we were going to be at the back 18th hole in the corner, you know, but it's not. He, he was like, no, I want to put them right here. And we can, we, you know, you come out of the clubhouse, you walk down this path, there's the putting green and there are the beehives right there. And so I just I was so tickled that he wanted to have them that visible. And then with the signs and then, you know, signage and everything, it really looks nice. He's done a good job. So you want a nice newer hive on display. You don't want one of the 10-year-old hives sitting there. You know, one of mine is what you're saying, I didn't want to say that. I didn't want to say that. I wasn't, just because I was looking at you, Kim, doesn't mean I was thinking of you. (laughs) Hey, I've seen those beehives. I know what they look like. (laughs) Well, they look worse now. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Scott, this just begs the question, can you or will you be doing some plantings for those bees in those areas that aren't getting doused with pesticides? You know, some bee garden or pollinator plants or something well we don't douse anything with pesticides <laughs> yeah, so. there you go. Wait, did you pick up on that scott just that yeah, yeah, yeah. negative too. connotation yeah. there 
<laughs> yeah. So, so we apply, we apply those pesticides very accurately and at the lowest amount possible. But yeah, we I actually had a pollinator plot prior to the location where the hive is now. I had a pollinator plot there before. It was part of a, a program through Audubon International, who we're a member of, which, by the way, just this week, we got our certification from for their cooperative sanctuary program for golf courses. So we received our certification this week and we were, we couldn't be more pleased. That was a long process to get through. We had a eight or 10 categories that we had to meet and, and it was a lot of work that went into that. We just had our site visit last week for our certification, but I had a pollinator plot there before. But yeah, we're, I'm actually going to do a monarch program this year because there's obviously an issue with monarchs and their their decline. So we're going to be planting a lot of milkweed and naturalizing some areas that we have out of play for monarch butterflies. So when we do that, we'll probably go back in and do some more pollinator plots. And what I've learned from Jennifer is, is that there's certain trees that provide way more benefit for honeybees versus just flowers. So we're looking at locations to start planting some of those trees and putting them in place and put signage up too to kind of tell people, hey, did you know that this tree provides this amount for honeybees? And so I'm excited about that and and to start that program. I heard at a meeting years ago that, and I have not yet found this research, so we're going to redo it. We're doing it this summer. A mature basswood tree has the same nectar production as three acres of clover. So if we can start thinking more vertically as opposed to horizontally, I mean, flowers are great. And I'm not, I don't want to just discourage anyone from planting flowers, perennials, annual shrubs, whatever. But we also need to, when we start thinking about our pollinator gardens, we need to do, we need to think vertically. And, you know, talking with Scott and, you know, hopefully they can, they'll be adding some trees we're doing that here in our small little town of Comer. I'm trying to make this a bee city USA and a tree city USA. Our campus, University of Georgia, is now a bee campus. Athens is now a bee city. So we're trying to really encourage people to think, yes, flowers are good, but think vertical trees are even better, especially for nectar and pollen availability. And another thing I wanted to throw in for the first time this year the, our bee lab as a fundraiser is doing pollinator garden flats. So basically you will buy a flat and that's your pollinator garden. It'll consist of about 12 different species of pollinator attracting flowers and come, it'll come with information about each plant. It will also come with a map. And so basically I'm just going to hand someone, here's your pollinator garden. So speaking of which, Scott, yeah. I'm thinking I need to hand that to you. No, I was going to ask, when can I put the order in? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. and, we're, and, and some of the things that we're going to have in there are not going to be necessarily the big, bold, you know, zinnias and, you know, the daffodils and the, not daffodils. Well, yeah, da, da, no, daffodil. What's the word I'm thinking of? The big, bold, the big ones. Sunflowers. <laughs> Sunflowers. <laughs> Sunflower, yeah. There we go. But now the big, bold flowers. You know, a lot of stuff that we're finding, like the mountain mints, provide nectar and pollen all season long. So we're looking at at flowers that are still going to be pretty or plants that are still going to be pretty, but more going to be more beneficial to our, our pollinators and not just our honeybees, but all sorts of pollinators and beneficial insects. So hopefully we'll we'll be able to work a little bit more. I've got some plans for you. Are you working with anybody, maybe the Xerxes Society, to establish a bee-friendly golf course certification which would be really cool to have a bee-friendly certification for a golf course, dissuade any of the you know chemical, or I, let's say pollinator-friendly golf course, because then that kind of instantly shuts down that conversation about golf courses are bad for the environment. No, I think that's fantastic. That's I would love to work with somebody on that. Actually, you know, I said I was recently elected to the Golf Course Superintendent Association of America. The, my first committee that I'm going to be on is the Environmental Committee. Yeah. So, yeah, here we go. Let's let's get the ball rolling and just talking to the right people like Jennifer and, and and you guys to try to figure out, okay, what's that avenue to kind of work with somebody that has the credentials and the credit behind them that would be willing to partner with us and and come and meet with us and try to develop something like that because – there's already beekeepers out there already that I know would love to have something like that, love to take that back to their clubs and and promote that within their clubs. 
I think that would be really ideal. I think many golf courses would like to have some sort of designation stating that they're pollinator friendly. I'm sure Xerxes is going to be happy to talk to you about that. They do a good job. The other thing that Jennifer is mentioning, the flowers that you're planting, of course, you're going to look at native flowers as opposed to invasive things, those sorts of things. But there's a group out there that they'll work with you also to get the right plants in your environment and, you know, where you are. You're not going to grow the same things in Georgia that I'm going to probably grow up here in Ohio. So what you want is the native plants, and that's just a step closer to being a bee-friendly golf course. Well, that's an interesting point that you bring up, Kim, about native. Native versus invasive. We have so many natives that have become residents of, of our area, and they're not going away, but they're not necessarily invasive. For instance, like we have uh, black and blue salvia, which is a, I mean, it is a pollinator magnet. It's a hummingbird magnet, but it's not from the, it's not from the United States. It's from South America, but it's not invasive. It doesn't take over areas. It's not throwing its seeds out. It's not like Chinese privet, you know, where here in the, in the Southeast, we are fighting that on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. However, Chinese privet does produce a lot of nectar and a lot of pollen. I say that quietly uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it is one of those, I mean, if people just go, it, it's, it's horrible. It can take over regions so quickly and, and push out all of our native vegetation. Is that the Chinese tallow? No, the Chinese tallow tree, that's a whole another can of worms. That's a tree that has been here, I guess, since like the 1700s it was brought over. And it has established itself, and it is pushing out our native trees like tupelos, especially in wetter kind of conditions. There is a fight going on right now between, and I don't know exactly who, but I just know there's a fight with a lot of our, our commercial, southern commercial beekeepers. They are fighting against the USDA eradication program of the Chinese tallow tree. Yeah, we've had an episode on the Chinese tallow. Yeah, there you go. But back to what Kim was saying about, you know, finding out what plants. I've been working closely with our University of Georgia Botanical Gardens. Heather over there, who runs a lot of the, they, they do a lot of plant sales and, and they have native gardens there at the Botanical Gardens. I've been working with her and asking a lot of questions, probably bugging her a little bit about our natives and what would be best and making sure that I'm not bringing in something or that we're going to plant something that would be invasive as opposed to non-native. So we have an amazing botanical gardens at the University mm -hmm. of Georgia, and it's actually located across the street from the golf course. And I've partnered with them on a couple of things, and they I actually help them out too because when they need equipment to do some things, I'll, I'll let them borrow it and take it over there. If they need turf grass advice, I've been able to provide them with turf grass advice. But I've brought them out before because the part of that Audubon International program was that you needed to plant native plant material if you put any plant material back in. So we had a project where we had a a subdivision that was built next to the golf course. And we kind of want to provide a little bit of a screen for that to kind of separate the golf course from us. So the the botanical gardens came out and, and gave me advisement on what to plant, what natives, you know, we have, we have our resident deer that we don't deter. You're not going to see a whole lot of flowers on my golf course just because we like to live in harmony with, with the wildlife that we have. So we don't plant a lot of flowers. So we, we were trying to find that balance, okay, natives and also deer resistance. So we've partnered with the Botanical Gardens, and, and they, it's great having them as a resource mm -hmm. here in Athens. I have, some, I have some plants for you that are deer resistant. I have a neighbor who feeds deer, and I've been trying <laughs> for years at my farm to find the perfect plants because they'll just mow, as you know, they just mow everything yeah. down. And I have, I have come across several, so I will share okay. them with you. Yeah, not to get off on a deer tangent, but I'm fighting the deer currently myself. I have a bunch of horse braided line for horse fencing on my property, and they've just torn through it with the antlers. They try to duck underneath it, get it hung up on their antlers, and then they jimmy it around until they snap that electric braid. And it's a lot of fencing to go through. Anyways, that's enough of a rant. <laughs> well, and I, if, if I can also add this too, and why I'm, I'm just beyond excited as far as what Scott is doing. I mean, think of the acreage that we have here in the United States for in golf courses. And 
you know, and, 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 you know, you're continuing to work and, and expand and, and maybe, you know, maybe they necessarily won't want to have a beehive, but just the fact that maybe they're wanting to plant things more, you know, to bring in other pollinators. I just, I'm excited by the whole project. And, and like I said, when Scott first called me and mentioned this, I, I could see all these doors opening as far as how it could be helping our pollinator populations. I can tell you, golf course superintendents are good stewards of the land, and we police ourselves. So if you're not doing something you're supposed to be doing, you're going to hear it from your colleagues. Mm -hmm. We're just very environmentally conscious in the things that we do. And I, I and I don't I can't name a person right off the top of my head that I don't think matches that criteria. Do you have a list of guidelines for working with a golf course to make it pollinator friendly, bee friendly? So if I wanted to go to my local golf course around the corner and say, hey, I really want to work with you to make it pollinator friendly. This comes from the University of Georgia. These are some suggestions of how to make your golf course pollinator friendly. And that way I can put bees there and know that you're not going to douse them with chemicals. <laughs> Use the word of the day. Sorry, Kim. <laughs> Do you have something like that available? You know, it's really up to the golf course superintendent to kind of reach out to individuals that are professionals in, in that that area. You know, we're always open that if somebody came to us and, and wanted to do something, we would. Now, written standards, I will tell you this. We do have BMPs, best management practices for golf courses, pollinators, and habitats are a part of those BMPs. And this is nationwide. This is our, our Golf Course Superintendent Association of America created this. I actually worked with Dr. Gary Hawkins at UGA to tweak it for the state of Georgia. So in the last four years, we created the BMPs for the state of Georgia for golf courses. And I've been fortunate enough to speak at the Georgia Environmental Conference three years now just talking about our BMPs and we've had a lot of other industries piggyback off of what we're doing. But we do have in our BMPs, there is some verbiage about that. But if you wanted to get really dialed down and really specific on it, I'm not sure that we have anything. I think there's probably resources out there, maybe through the Audubon International and some other partners that we have. I, there, there probably is something out there that I'm not aware of. There is. The bee friendly people, bee friendly farming is one group. And that's when you're farming, what don't you do? When do you do it? That sort of thing. They're set up to do that. That's what they do. They make bee friendly and then they make sure that you say bee friendly. So if you go looking, I'm going to guess if you just Google bee friendly farming, you'll find the group that does it. Who is it? The Project APSM, Jeff, that does that? Because we've had them on the show before. There is a group. And you could be, you could start a group called Bee Friendly Golf Courses. Ah, I love it. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm obviously going to let my colleagues know that I was on this podcast and share it with them. And hopefully we'll have quite a few listen to it and, and hopefully they'll hear what you just said and, and reach out. Like Jeff said, how much land is in golf courses in this country? If you turn every one of them into a pollinator haven, I'm not saying that yours isn't, but if it was recognized as a pollinator haven, suddenly you've opened up a bazillion acres of friendly space for pollinators to be in and know that they're going to be safe just because of the, yeah, I mean, you've already got a good set of guidelines. You're doing it right already, but this would just one step up. That's uh, the pollinator partnership, P2, who does the bee friendly farming. That's it. That's it. So there are groups out there that have already started these, these kinds of programs and you could pick up with them and probably take out another step. If we don't need to reinvent the wheel, then we're not going to do that. I mean, we're not ashamed to piggyback on anybody. It's kind of like GPS technology. Well, we got that from the farming side of things. So, but we're we're more than happy to kind of piggyback anything that makes us better. And you know, and if we're not having to do all that legwork, so be it. I mean, let's get let's get to the end point faster. Then, my cousin worked for Jack Nicholas designing golf courses for several years up in Columbus, Ohio. I should have talked to him earlier. I'm going to have to go ring him up and use it bees as an excuse to talk to my cousin. <laughs> but this has been a fascinating discussion. Time has flown by. Is there anything that we haven't discussed that you want to make sure our listeners hear about bees and golf? 
Well, I just want to tell you how excited I am to be on this podcast, to be honest with you. I don't know if Jennifer told me or not, or I found it on my own, but I've been listening to your podcast for the last six months because I've been trying to soak in as much information as I can and learn because I mean, you're not going to know everything when you first start out and you start to learn. There's a lot to it. I mean, there's a lot of ins and outs and things that need to be done. I'm actually going to try to join my lo- local beekeepers association so that I can get even more help outside of Jennifer because she's super busy. Hopefully, maybe I can do some trade-offs with some rounds of golf. But, <laughs> you know, your podcast and other YouTube videos have been so valuable to me as I continue to learn. And I would encourage any beekeepers who are just starting out or who are looking to get into it, reach out to those experts because much like the golf course superintendent world, we're we're helpful, we help each other and we're all in it together. I feel like the beekeeping community is the same exact way. And and beekeepers love to have people outside of the industry asking them about their their industry. So it's a good our two industries gel really well as far as that's concerned. That's good to hear. Yeah. I totally agree with what you just said, you know, and and Kim, you know, I mean, we've been, how long have we been educating beekeepers? There's a lot of really bad information out there, but there's a lot of good information. And I know that you all have been putting out these awesome podcasts for years now. So excited to finally be on one. (laughs) <laughs> it took them years to get me here. My gosh. Well, we wanted to make sure we had the show down right before we invited you on the show. We did want to get embarrassed. So, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but no, that, it's a very good point, especially to our new new beginner beekeepers out there. Get a mentor, find a local club. Don't necessarily listen to everything you you're seeing or viewing or hearing on YouTube. I see I see there's good stuff out there, but sometimes I just want to reach through the screen and tell people <laughs> to stop it. What they're doing, like putting oxalic acid in moonshine and blowing it into their colonies. No, I have I have to say, I've not seen that video yet. <laughs> no, 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 I'll avoid that one. And the other thing I always warn beekeepers, and we're getting off track, but it's all local too. So what works in Georgia may not work in Washington State, where I'm at. Well, the basics are there. You know, the basics are the same. Like, keep your heart levels down, keep your bees well fed. But correct, I mean, you've got cold weather and we don't, or, you know, we have humidity and you might not. I mean, yeah, microenvironments are, yeah, it's very important to know your your local local climate. And golf courses are no different. I mean, doing we have microclimates within a hundred mile radius. You know, mm-hmm. a colleague of mine, fifty miles down the road, is probably dealing with something I'm not, just because his elevation or his tree coverage. And so there's the microclimates are or even local. But when you start separating between Georgia and Ohio, then you start to see large differences. Then, well, it's been fantastic. Thanks so much for being here, and we look forward to having you both back at one time or another. It's been a fun conversation. It has been, and I hope the next time we talk, you've got the first bee-friendly golf course in Georgia. I'll take that as a challenge. (laughs) (laughs) All right, thanks for joining us. Thank Thank you. So, Kim, do you play golf? No, I don't. A lot of years ago, I used to work with University Extension, and when I went to a golf course, it was to solve a problem that they were having with some bug, and that was a long time ago. I don't golf, but... I tell you, this thing today, it got me excited. If you turn every golf course in the U.S. into a pollinator heaven, that would be fantastic. You think about it and you think, oh, my gosh, that's so obvious. It's right there. Why not take advantage of it? So I think this is a great program. And I think that if if no one else picks up the certified pollinator-friendly golf course program, I think that's something that beekeeping today ought to do. (laughs) <laughs> well, certainly, if you are associated with a golf course out there, it would be something to touch base with them on and maybe get them interested, or maybe they know about it and you can help them out getting them even more information. So I think there's an opportunity here we can't afford to miss. I agree. Let's get after it. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download and stream the show. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. 
We want to thank our regular episode sponsors, Global Patties and Strong Microbials and Better Bee for their longtime support of this podcast. Thanks to Hive Alive for returning this spring, and thanks to Northern Bee Books for their generous support. Check out all of their books at www.northernbeebooks.co.uk. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to leave us questions and comments at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.